Hey, hello. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Uh, you've heard from me before, uh, like 20 minutes ago. Anyway, the details of my life are inconsequential. So let's talk about what I've been working on, though. And for the last, you know, maybe a year and a half now, um, I've been playing around with a lot of experiments that involve HTTP2. At the beginning, it was still speedy, SPDY. And uh, slowly, it sort of evolved into something a little bit bigger that I now call Commons Host. Um, and it's sort of a CDN. And it's pretty cool to be talking about it here at Cloudflare. I hope there's no offense taken. Um, I mean none. And let's get uh, straight into this and why I'm calling it like hybrid and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, well, if you follow the Cloudflare CEO's Twitter like you should, um, he talks a lot about this really hot topic today, which is Intel versus ARM. All right, OK. Anyway, so Intel and ARM, two architectures. And um, what does that mean when you're running servers, right? Um, two different CPU architectures. When you're, when you're paying for you know, uh, servers, and, or for those who are not, you know, you still kind of are using those servers if you're routing your website through them. Right? And so we're you know, consuming a lot of energy. And the big selling point that is being highlighted like right now is um, that ARM's, ARM CPUs use a lot less power than Intel CPUs. And that's kind of interesting. I mean, if you're you know, running a service like a CDN, like Cloudflare, um, you probably, you're switching over to um, ARM is a kind of an interesting thing. So you know, Matthew Prince, the CEO of Cloudflare, um, sort of pointed that out recently. And I was very interested in that, because you know, the numbers don't really lie, even though that is probably a lie, because that's some kind of sale, sales pitch at a sales convention. So you know, grain of salt and all that. But still, there's something to it, I think. Um, and I was, the more I thought about that, I felt like this sort of like a deja vu, right? Um, sort of around the time that this movie, The Matrix, was created about 20 years ago in 1998. <laughs> this thing came out. Ooh, cool, right? And that was not retro at the time, that was like state of the art design. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, these people came out with this really cool idea that you could search the entire web and had this, everyone knows the story, right? The page rank thing, and you know, they've kind of improved on everyone else. And, but one of the things that I remember from back then, and I'm dating myself a little bit here, is that it was first hosted on, 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 on this cool system here. And in fact, these two boxes here, those were the ones that ran Google search, okay? You, you know what Google does today in terms of scale and ser servers, and you, I mean, you can even, you can imagine. We don't know, even, but um, the the crazy thing is that these were commodity hardware at the time. This is what everyone was running at home. You know, this is what you would play your games on. That's what I was doing. Um, Intel just donated them just to see what they could do with it because it's like a cheap thing. Nobody serious is going to run an actual company on on you know this this desktop you know mid mid tower thing. Um, but they did, and it worked. And then you know, IBM was like, wait, 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 wait. we, we want to be part of your company because we see you taking off. So they, they donated some you know, fancy boxes, all the ones that you see underneath the table. And that's sort of, I guess, where they ended up staying. Um, they ran some ancillary services on those, but it's too late. Like, the, the commodity thing happened. The, the big idea of Google was not just a search thing, but it was actually that you could scale giant internet services on commodity hardware because you need to go for the best performance per dollar. You don't care about the most powerful servers in the world as a single unit. You care about what is most efficient to run as a business. And so if we move forward to back to today, um, I think that the commodity hardware of 20 years ago has sort of changed and has now sort of become the, um, you know, maybe a little bit of what the enterprise hardware at the time was. And so I feel like there's, there's, there's sort of a, there's an impression right now that Intel versus ARM of this Goliath and this David story. Um, everyone who's familiar with um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, the, the David versus Goliath thing, things are not as they seem, right? You, you think, you know, the Goliath, the big guy, you know, the big warrior with the armor and the weapons is like super strong and cannot be defeated. And you think the little guy is going to get squished. Um, but actually, you know, he's got the technical, technological superiority. This thing here, this little sling, turns out that has about the, you know, the, the kinetic energy of a, of a, of a, of a you know, handgun today. And, you know, he was, you know, the big guy had no chance, right? So, right now, Intel sort of feels like they're just huge, you know, monster CPUs, these Xeons, 24 cores or what have you, um, you know, king of, king of performance. Whereas ARM, you kind of think of, you know, that's the stuff that you have in your pockets or your hands, if you're not paying attention. Um, 
and it, it doesn't seem like a fair battle, but I like to make the case that it totally is. And when I, go, when I look at today at the, the, the sort of the best performance per dollar, I think of uh, all the phones up to last year. <laughs> okay? Because, yeah, nobody wants to buy the last iPhone, the last Samsung, the last whatever, right? They're gone, they're ancient history. But the thing is that there were so many made last year of those CPUs that you know, the, 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 the leftover capacity, the leftover volume that was produced in these chips is, is probably still really significant numbers. And they don't really go bad because silicon is sort of nicely protected in a dust-free case and whatever. And so this is a screenshot from um, Alib Alibaba or AliExpress or whatever. You can buy these chips by the thousands of like any of the old you know, Samsung phones or whatever. You can just buy them by the thousands. And um, this gentleman here who's not paying attention is, uh, everyone knows is Mario. If you don't know, know him, he's a really cool guy who organizes this, this amazing conference called uh, FAS Asia, which just happened last month. Uh, it'll happen again next year, you should totally attend. And this person here is uh, called Bunny Huang, and he's an amazing, um, and, and he tells amazing stories about the sort of the, this, the hardware market in, in, in Shenzhen and what's happening there. And one, one thing that really struck me during his talk last month was that he goes into these little shops, these like individual, this, this, it kind of looks like, like some, you know, okay, you go into these little shops and they sell just reels of components and just like massive numbers of chips. And he was, he was adding up like how many are there and came to the conclusion that like a single one of these shops would have more like in, in, their, in their little shop than like you could find on all the American, you know, the distributor websites that you could order, like in the entire North America, right? It's ridiculous. And, and it's not because they're like, you know, they really love these chips, it's just because they're really good traders and they know where to buy the cheap stuff and then sell it to someone else who's got a project. You can go into these things with a bunch of cash and buy like a million chips. So, so there's a lot of these things still available, but they're all kind of like last year's you know, performance stuff that is now dethroned. But in terms of cost efficiency, I think it really makes sense. And I've been looking at, um, at these things from a perspective of how do we run them and what would it, you know, what, what else can we point out? Anyway, so if I look at servers, desktops, how many of it are, are being produced and shipped every year? You see that servers is kind of going up. Desktops, I think obviously is going down. Mobile phone, whoo, kind of exploding, now tapering off because it turns out there's only so many people in the world. <laughs> so if we look at the, the actual numbers across a couple of different categories, there's about 11 million servers every year. Sounds like pretty cool, right? That's, that's, let's, let's assume that they're all like, Intel, right? Um, desktops are a lot more though, and hence, hence that's why we started with the, the commodity hardware. Like desktops was the commodity, and then you, you take from that market and you sort of create a high performance version of that, and that's why servers made sense to run on Intel. Laptops sort of taking over now. Tablets actually bigger than laptops, that was surprising to me. But the real kicker is that phones, right? Okay, it's just ridiculous. 133 times more phones than servers. All right. Now, Tablets, actually, but definitely phones, most of them are going to be running ARM. What's ARM? What does it stand for? Acorn, Risk, Machines, you know? I like emojis. Anyway, it turns out Acorn was renamed to Advanced. It turns also out that that's the chestnut, the Acorn, whatever. <laughs> so let's just call it ARM. So most of the mobile processors, like the phones and, the, um, and, the, and even most of the tablets, there's going to be ARM. So we all have ARM processors. In fact, we probably have a lot of them. There's been over 100 billion of these things produced. 100 billion is a big number. Um, more than the number of people, right? Weird. So you find them everywhere. And the reason you find them everywhere, and the reason why there's so many, is it's not just like this company arm that produces them. There's a ton of companies that make them. And the, they're actually, when you, you look at these logos, and this is just a, a, a small selection. A lot of these are actually competitors, you know, like Samsung, Apple, Nvidia, AMD, you know, whatever. So how does that work? Uh, actually, it turns out ARM doesn't even sell these chips. They license stuff. So two things primarily. One is the instruction set that these chips run, right? Current generation is ARM V8, you know, but they've been doing this for a while. So that means that you can, you can create a chip that actually implements their instructions. And that's what I meaning some companies like Apple, like if you have, you know, they'll talk about like their custom SIP chips, but they actually just implement this, you know, not just, okay, it's a really amazing uh, you know, thing, <laughs> but they implement this standard, you know, instruction set. And, but ARM also licenses sort of a, the next level uh, of abstraction would be like the, the actual cores. And so if you're, if you're a system integrator and you want to you know, 
play a video playback device that can do 60, you know, 60 hertz, 4K HDR, right? You have a certain performance envelope, maybe a certain power budget. You know, you can talk to your arm and get like, okay, you need these, this many of these specific cores, and then go off and have somebody fab those chips. And so that's that's sort of the business model, and that's why there's so many companies able to produce these things in such volumes. Now, risk actually used to mean that these were very simple chips that were very low power and couldn't really do much and you had to like write everything in software which is one of the pros and cons at the same time. Now, these days they've actually kind of come closer to what Intel offers with a lot of you know, very specific, high, very powerful and energy efficient instructions. And even in the latest generations of like ARM V8 that I mentioned, there's hardware accelerated crypto stuff. So really cool for all of us who are web performance people and you know, want to use HTTP2 because that's the greatest thing ever, and in the future, quick. And all these things are requiring 100% encryption of all your traffic. Otherwise, the, the buzzer just won't, uh, won't work with it. So you need to have, you know, these, these efficient hardware accelerated crypto stuff in, your, in all of your devices. Otherwise, you're going to consume too much battery or it's going to be slow. Um, on the other end of the spectrum today, there's also, like, these really powerful ARM processors, those are the ones that, you know, in the first slide that I, you know, I showed, those are running servers. So those might have, you know, 20, 40, whatever cores, and they can take on workloads that are equivalent to whatever the Intel Xeons can do today at reduced power budgets, right? Because they benefit from all that shared investment into the technology of that platform. So let's get back onto what we're actually here for, which apparently is now the CDN meetup, because all the three talks are about CDNs. And I'm going to do a little comparison. Um, First, I'll, like, I'll explain like, sort of how a traditional CDN works. And this isn't, I, don't mean to pick, I don't mean to pick on Netflix. They do amazing work, and they're a really great service. It's just as a reference point, we can all relate to that, because most of us have probably used it. They, they're extremely uh, successful. They serve about a third of the traffic in the United States for many years uh, at, the, at their peak levels. So that's huge, huge, huge scale. And I want to compare that to something that I've been working on, which is nowhere close to that level. Um, you know, uh, and it's called Commons Host. And what that is actually is world's smallest CDN. Okay, this is an open source project that I've been working on. It's based on Node.js. Um, last year, I worked on the Node.js core implementation of HTTP/2. That's all open source. And since then, I've been working on like a little web server built on top of that, some front end tooling to basically be able to deploy stuff. And I am now at the point where I'm actually even deploying these little servers, you know, sort of around the place, starting to, and uh, that's all running this open source stack, which I think is kind of a unique thing. Um, the reason I'm doing this all with open source is I hope that other people can also deploy these things, and together we can create a network that is sort of the largest CDN, right? I think it would be kind of hilarious to use these tiny little servers, these open source scrappy little thing made by some, you know, random bunch of people, and we become like a really huge network of CDN servers. So that's sort of what I want to do in a really short amount of time, because I, I can't really afford to work on this for like ever. So we need to make this happen really quickly in the next couple of months or a year, whatever it is. You know, if you look at other CDNs and how long they took, uh, I want to accelerate that. And so I have this thing. So, and just to prove that I have this thing, I've brought it along. And this, this is a CDN server in this box. So I'm not hiding. It's all open hardware as well. It's a company called Odroid. It's a Korean company. And they make these little uh, sort of NAS servers, and like, like these little network attached you know, hard drive things that you put on your network for backups. Sorry, could you? Could you help me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm very proud of my baby here. Uh, okay, so this is a server, a networked ARM-based tiny little server, and it contains an, an SL, it contains an SSD. It has a gigabit port and a power connection, and that's really just about it. And this is what I've been using to host the commons.host website. So if you go to that, you're hitting something like this that's currently at my house. Um, and I'll t so anyway, you can pass this around and show it around. Please don't break it. It actually belongs to this gentleman right now because I'm selling them now. But not that not that that's the point of part of point of this talk. But you know, just to, he's he's a cool dude. He'll find you. <laughs> so anyway, so if you look at the specs of these things, completely different ballgame. Um, 
that Netflix uh, has is called the Open Connect Appliance. This is an initiative that they took because they used to be running on a, on a, a third party CDN, and I guess at some point, once you hit a certain scale, the fees of these things become really expensive, and you start thinking, oh, what, why, why couldn't we do this ourselves? So they came up with this thing called Open Connect Appliance. Now, while it's called Open, it's kind of hard for me to find information about it. So, caveat, this is really just sort of guesses based on you know all kinds of articles that may or may not be technical or, or publicity or whatever. Um, but, you know, so again, not exactly picking on Netflix because I don't really know what they do. But you can sort of imagine an eight-core Xeon, whereas this thing contains an eight-core, you know, Samsung Exynos. And Exynos is a, what's in their phones, what's in the Samsung Galaxy phones. In fact, I think this is literally from, from, a, from a Galaxy S5 from a couple of years ago, or a Note 4 or something like that. So this is not like state-of-the-art, but it gets the job done, in my experience. Netflix, they'll talk to you once you do more than five gigabits. Like, who's, who's it that they talk to? They talk to ISPs who have a lot of customers watching Netflix. That costs a lot of money for both of the ISP as well as Netflix. So at a certain level, they go and like, knock on your door and say, you should put this little pop. We'll pay for it. Don't worry. Uh, and just connect it to your network. Give us a certain amount of bandwidth. And about you know, five to 20 gigabits, I think, is roughly what they serve on these servers. And they consume about this much power because that's what you need to provide them. They have a bunch of you know, hard drives in them, like 30 or 40 hard drives. Uh, offering about 100 to 200 terabytes of storage, as far as I know, and I'm guessing that they spend about 10 to 20 thousand dollars on the hardware, the bill of materials. This guy, Odroid, it's the Korean thing that I mentioned, right? I, it's got a little tiny eight-core CPU from, from basically a phone. Uh, it's got a one gigabit port. That's the big deal because people are like, might be like, "Well, oh, what about Raspberry Pi? Why don't you just use that?" Well, Raspberry Pi doesn't really have a good network connection. This thing is slightly better in that in that respect. Um, 20 watts. Compared to 750 watt, that's a big difference. But this is this is essentially not using much more than an actual phone. So very low power, very cheap to run. Contains one hard drive, not 30 or 40, one hard drive. Extremely cheap. And this is not a sales pitch. I just want to you know compare the numbers. This is ridiculous. Like, there's orders of magnitudes difference, and you can tell just the, the vast majority of the money goes into actual storage and the size of what you want want to host. So sort of the numbers that I you know that I want to. We use. Oh, and oh, by the way, they're very cute. Uh, you can actually stack them, um, which I think is really cool. And if you let your imagination play, uh, oh yeah. So when you, when you stack them, you should use something like ARP, which is a little low-level protocol, which means that you connect like a bunch of them to your like router, and they all have like the same IP address, and so they kind of load balance automatically. So it's quite scalable if you think about that. Um, but if you really think about that, then how far can you go? And this is too slow. Okay. Okay. What if you did this? So if somebody has done this, somebody with uh, about 200 of them, they, they, these are slightly modified. You can also get them without the hard drive support. So this is purely for compute cluster. Like say you want to run like a, a joint Kubernetes. But I figure about $30,000, I can get 200 of them to stuck together and make like a giant 200 gigabit per second server. Uh, I'm not sure where I'd plug that even into because I don't have an internet exchange at my house. I'm like. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe card for people could help me with that, probably, right? Um, but but I but I think that that's maybe not the point. Like I don't want to build, you know, a giant mega server in one place when a CDN is all about serving lots of places, right? And by making them really cheap, I can split them up more easily, I think, right? And the way I look at it is, you should track where people live with a CDN. So the closer you can get to the most people, the better it should be. That's sort of what I'm hoping for. So if I get 200 of them and put them everywhere, how does that compare to everyone else? Um, so you know, I've kind of looked around. And again, these are not exact numbers. And I love all these companies. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of get a reference for validating or invalidating my own ideas and hypotheses. Now, most of the CDNs have like a couple hundred, or you know, dozens to a couple hundred. Akamai has a really pretty huge number. Um, Alibaba, and like somewhere in China, they have ridiculous numbers for these servers. I don't know what that, it, it, that maybe they just mean like that's the, how many computers they have, not how many actual locations. I don't, I don't know. So some of these numbers are a bit weird. Um, but mostly they have like a couple of hundred. And I don't think that's nearly enough because there's about, you know, 560 million people or, and, and, you know, or 500 something cities, sort of cities, that have over a million people, over a thousand, you know, urban areas, like sort of like cities, agglomerations, whatever you call it over half a million, and BGP active ASNs, you know, that might be a little, 
jargony. That means that an ASN is sort of a unique, no, no, it means an autonomous system number. That means every single network on the internet has its, has its own unique number that they registered. And BGP Active means that they're actually announcing routes to their network. So that's probably the number of maximum, the highest number of ISPs in the world. Now maybe, maybe it's a lot less than that. Maybe it's, I think some estimates I've seen are also like around 10, 20,000. But there's, there's like 10, 20,000 ISPs or computer networks or universities or whatever in the world. And if you have a couple of hundred pops, you're not really close to all these networks, I feel. So my idea, I was like, what if these, you know, data server racks, you know, each one has like about 10 gigabit, right, and stores all the data. What if we're more like that? Um, this is literally my house from a few months ago. Um, what if they're, you know, they look kind of similar to me, and they all have about the same connectivity, they have power, they have air conditioning, and all that kind of stuff too. So there's this thing called fiber to the foo. Right, fiber to the you know neighborhood or, or or to the you know to the curb to the building to the home. In Singapore, most of us have fiber to the home, FTTH, and this is sort of a really interesting um, game changer. I feel in Asia, and I wasn't even aware of this. This is sort of like you know my random idea, like why why don't you turn HDBs into data centers? But then I started looking into this, and it turns out that the rest of Asia also lives in, in apartments, and it turns out that actually this is really cheap to deploy today. So if you look at look around Asia, and you see all the cities that are being developed right now. They're all building fiber. Nobody's putting in DSL and cable anymore. People are putting fiber because you go to China and you buy it in bulk, and you just deploy it. It's dirt cheap, and you get infinite capacity essentially, right? Because you can upgrade this for decades. And it's pretty much everywhere now in, in, in you know China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, India. You look at all the cities, and you can like just search for like a fiber ISP, and you'll find them almost everywhere. Doesn't mean that everyone's using it, but sort of this cons this. I feel like this is maybe like a like a San Francisco type of sort of image of Asia as everyone's like struggling on 2G, you know, feature phones. That's not really the case. That might be the case on average in comparison, but there's a lot of places that are really, really developed in terms of infrastructure. And I think we all live in one of those as an example. And everyone is copying that, obviously. So you can get fiber in almost every city in Asia, right? Um, most of the world's fiber subscribers are in Asia. That was a quote from about a year and a half ago. It's, oh, it's only getting better. It's pretty impressive. I didn't, again, this is new to me. Let's look around the world a little bit. There's this really cool map that I just wanted to show for no reason. Um, if, you, if you look at Africa, um, things are a little bit weird there, I think. I, don't, I haven't really visited much, but um, the reports that I'm reading, sort of market and analysis kind of stuff, they still talk about heat and dust being problems for data centers. Like, whoa, OK, this is, this is not the same. So I think. These kind of places are like what they, what they euphemistically describe as require a more pioneering mindset. Um, sure, yeah. Now, that's going to be hard, but I think the way to solve that is, again, with you know, even lower cost stuff. Not, not, not saying we're going we're gonna to deploy hundred, hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure overnight. You, know, you start somewhere, right? And I feel like the best place to start is what they've already done, which is put handphones in everyone's pockets. There's, there's more handphones in the world, and also especially in those places, than there are toothbrushes and toilets combined. Right? That's insane. Right? OK. So I think that this sort of solution would kind of work in this kind of environment as well. And um, I looked into this a little bit further and found that you know, the number of data centers per capita, this might not be 100% reliable, accurate data, but I think it's sort of all of it is inaccurate enough to compare. I don't know. So if you look at per capita data centers, India uh, versus Africa, you know, similar population, but four times more data centers in India than all of Africa. South Africa is doing pretty well, though. Good job to them. Uh, Singapore, though, is just completely insane. We have way too many data centers. I mean, yeah, more data centers, right? But, but it, the numbers are just kind of, you know, amazing. Um, so we want everyone to be at Singapore level, which is probably what most cities in like developed countries approximate. I don't know. We might be like number one. Seriously, this is crazy. Um, but like you want them to be somewhere here, and if you have like this few, like if, like this is ridiculous number of people per data center. This doesn't work, right? You need to put servers not just in a data center, but every, everywhere else, and then slowly you can develop towards you know having sophisticated infrastructure. Um, anyway, quickly run through again like our comparison. So right now, a typical CDN that you know provides this cloud where you just send all your traffic to and they magically handle with everything. They go out and negotiate peering or transit. That means that they figure out how to send, send bits around the internet. And they might pay for it or they might not pay for it, depending on how they negotiate that. You have no clue what's going on with your data. They take care of that. It's, not, it's a nice abstraction. It's very comfortable. I use it. Um, 
but I'm trying to some, build something that you could maybe deploy your own CDN like I'm doing right now. I'm trying to host my sites on my own computers and share computers with my friends and we can agree with each other which ones we host. Um, the technology to actually coordinate that traffic with a traditional model is called Anycast IP. And there's only so many registries that give you an IP address. Right? You get it from your ISP, but your ISP buys it from a registry. And there's a few of them, and they're very regional. So if you're in Asia, you get it from this one. If you're in America, you get it from that one. And they use this protocol, again, BGP, this, this word that came back from earlier, to, to manage that. And again, you have no insight in that, because that's just announcing, you know, hey, here's, me, here, here's my IP address. All my peers that I'm connected to, you can send traffic to me. Uh, whereas what I'm doing is called GeoDNS. And that's available from anyone. Like, there's a lot of vendors out there. I've, you know, on my GitLab, you'll find like a list of like dozens of them that you can play with. Um, they're very cheap, but because of that, right? There's so much competition, and you kind of have total control over that. You can say this domain should point to this, you know, IP address in that country or on that ISP. It should point to that IP address, and you can sort of manage that yourself. Um, you know, like I said, everything I do is open source, whereas typically most CDNs are going to be proprietary, and that's potentially for security reasons, so I have to come up with actual stuff that is proven as well. But I think it's nice that you can play, with, play around with the code, and other people could, you know, modify stuff, and, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I don't want to talk too much. This is not a commercial pitch. I'm sorry. Now, one thing that, I, that scares me a little bit about uh, CDN putting stuff on a CDN is that sure you get like a million benefit for DDoS protection because of the huge scale that they, that they provide, but it's sort of a man in the middle service that I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with, and I think some people have those reservations when, for instance, your you know your cloud your 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 your, your, um, your cloud provider gives you a certificate. That's cool, but it also means that they can spoof whatever you do. Now, of, of course, their business depends on not doing that, but what if other people snuck in there? They become a target, and so there's all these you know things that you want to think about now. I don't want to sound too fuddy about it, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, I, in fact, I wanted to share how some, another network, one of the, probably one of the largest networks in the world works, and it's, it's this thing here, it's RIPE. One of the, it's one of the registries, I think they handle Europe and the Middle East. Um, RIPE Atlas is a project that they have where they're nonprofit, and they just send out these little rebranded TP-Link routers with their custom firmware on it. If you ask for one politely, they'll send you one for free. And you just plug this into your house, and you join their network, and you can then run like sort of sensors, right, or what do you call it? You can sort of run tests, like performance tests. You can ping people from around the world, basically. And because you you contribute one to the network, they let you use other people's probes from around the world as well. And you sort of, you know, everyone sort of contributes something. It's a total nonprofit situation, but it works pretty well because they have over like over 10,000 of these things around the world. I've got one in my house, and I'm actually. Um, we should, you know, anyone here who wants to run one of these things? Okay. Do you live in a cool place that's not Singapore? <laughs> like, because there's, there's loads of these in Singapore, and I, I really want someone who puts this into like, like some company in whatever, some place. Yeah, 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 we could, we could talk, we could, okay, afterwards. Let's, let's, let's. Uh, I promised it to someone else before, but I forgot their name, so if you are here, you have dibs, right? So sorry. If you're not here, good, too bad, too bad. Um, anyway, so I, I, think, I think that this, this sort of, my point is that this proves that it can be done. People are generally nice and put these things out everywhere, and, and it, it works, it really scales. It's a really cool thing. You should check it out. So again, my goal, create the largest CDN closest to the most people in the shortest amount of time, and all because of these tiny little things. And I wanted to ask for some help, because I've been doing this for about a year and a half now on my own, and it's, it's, you know, it's pretty cool, but it's also hard. Um, I need just people to use this, okay? So it's free. Okay, you don't have to worry, I'm going to charge you for anything. You, you just publish a website just like you would have done GitHub Pages or, or Netlify or Surge or whatever, you, all these other things. You just post your static sites there. That's it. Do that, please. And as you do that, you'll probably find that there's things broken. So please tell me about those things. And I'll record them as bugs and we can you know, have a discussion and fix those. Uh, if you have any suggestions for features, you know, I'll, I'll open to that. In fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a GitLab page. If you just look me up, you'll probably find my GitLab repository for all this. You'll, you'll find out there's already a bunch of stuff planned and being discussed right now. Um, also, if you're interested in hosting one of these things, again, if you like live in Singapore or, or, or other places, Vietnam, right, and you want to host one of these things, actually, like, we have another gentleman here who wants to run one in Vietnam, but the cool thing is that we can put lots of these everywhere, because they're so small, you also probably need lots of them. Um, I want to put these everywhere in the world, and I have, I've already talked to a lot of friends in, 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 in various cities around Southeast Asia from other, like, mostly other developers that just want to provide hosting to their, you know, friends in their city, because 
let's face it, these are not the places with the best infrastructure, and this way they can contribute you know, slightly to alleviate that, uh, those performance issues. You can have faster websites in every city by just putting one of these pops there. Um, so I am also not fabulously wealthy, unfortunately. Um, so like I pointed out, they're pretty cheap. Um, and I feel like if, 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 like if you're working for a company that has visitors from any of these other countries and you're finding it hard to actually reach them with your websites and you, and you want to just fix those performance issues really cheaply, just, you know, I'll help you set them up everywhere you want. Um, I'll, I'll go and I'll send them out or I'll, I'll, I'll go in person if I have to. Um, so I, I think that we can sort of match hosts and funding people that are really nice and solve this problem. We'll figure it out. And lastly, just tell people about this. I'm, I'm, very, I'm quite proud of this project, and I would love people to actually you know, find out about it and use it. And that's what I wanted to talk about. And you know, I think we should have these huge ideas, but really just start small and stay focused and keep working on it. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Sebastian, for an interesting talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, go right ahead. So it's actually just last week that we spoke to Akamai. So we were talking about a, talking about a partnership for Indonesia, and they have 1,437 servers, or POPs, points of presence in Indonesia, 137,000 globally. So yeah, yeah, we need like I'll update my slides. Yeah, so it's either like join them or like really everyone has to join to kick their ass. So it's not, <laughs> not exactly, right, but yeah. So thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I have a question if, if everybody's still thinking. Uh, so how do I get started? I, I went to the page right now, commons.host slash sign up, and uh, it loads a blank page. So I think this is a bug report, actually. Yeah, uh, but uh, so I go and buy one, I sign up, and then npm install uh, so instructions, and then what happens? That's right. So actually, right now, to, to, to just deploy your site, it, you just use an NPM tool. So this is very easy to put it into like your, your, your Travis config. You know, so just like you deploy to any other web server, it's a one-line command thing. You, you use a sign up on the website that I'll check why it's not loading. Or it could be a Firefox issue as well, because I'm, I'm using web components. And maybe this is more for the front end dev, but Firefox and web components don't get along. It actually works really well in Safari and Chrome. And I'm doing this to sort of make a point that they should just implement it. Um, I'm actually using a Firefox beta browser on the mobile phone, so that might be exactly the reason. I'll double check. OK. OK. And yeah, I'm sorry. So just to, just to finish that, I actually last night, um, uh, so I had a really nice friend here, a really good friend, uh, Kenny, thank you very much, uh, for sponsoring the first server. And that's possibly, oh, it's still around. Nice. In one piece? Good, good. Uh, so. I, you know, like, like I was saying, I can't fund all these things myself out of pocket, so I actually put it up on Carousel now. Um, turns out people from the rest of the world can't use Carousel. So anyway, I might, I might change that. But the, you know, if, if you want one of these things, just check out Carousel or, or tweet, tweet me, and, and we'll make that happen. Um, you can put these in your house and have like the world's fastest you know, self-hosted website on your own CDN. So the idea is actually like going forward, it won't just be like your own website. It, you can actually like, trade that with other people because I think we, we actually have a fundamental business issue here um, that needs to be solved where it's, I, I don't think a single company like myself, I don't see myself being like amazingly better than a Cloudflare or an Akamai, for instance, uh, at, at managing this sort of level of network, right? I think actually this problem is, goes beyond the capability of a single uh, company or organization. I don't think that can be done by one hierarchy. I think this is something like the internet that is just the entirety of humanity needs to do this. And we just need some tools. And I'm just trying to build those tools. That's why it's open source. You can use these yourself. You can spin them, fork them off. And if, you know, if, like, for instance, everyone else mentions the China case, like, you want to run a CDN in China, like, you, you can't really do that if you're outside of China. There's all kinds of legal issues and restrictions. But if, you, if you're based in China and you got these tools, you could set it up probably better than I could. And I didn't, I didn't even need to know that person. They could just run and do that. Sort of like how we set up Nginx or Apache, right? It's just a tool that's available, and we just use it. The, the author of you know, Nginx, uh, Igor Sisoyev, you know, Saint, um, they don't really know what we're doing with, it, with their server. It doesn't matter. It's fine. And so I'm just trying to contribute something. And, and this whole, you know, if it looks like I'm trying to monetize and all that, that's really just sort of I can stay alive. I have a very humble lifestyle, but it does cost a little bit of money. <laughs> and that's really all that is. It's not supposed to be a huge company. I'm not looking for funding and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, I just literally want to connect people so that they can deploy it as they want. 
Um, yeah. So, oh, one more question. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it came a bit wrong. Okay. So uh, just to clarify, Akamai does have 99% of the servers, but serves 1% of the companies globally. So it, it's kind of a little bit paradox because they only serve like the one percenters because nobody else can afford them. That's why a lot of companies are like talking to us and we're partnering like with the, with the likes of Cloudflare, Cloudfront to actually uh, minimize the gap between what Cloudflare can do to, uh, to companies as compared to what Akamai can do because currently it's really difficult to compete with them and they're not really talking to small companies. You can try it. We've tried it. Like it took us really a long time to actually get into negotiations over a partnership with them because they simply do not talk to small companies. They ask you about your, your bandwidth and we tell them actually that we serve client, you know, across all our clients, like we serve a lot of terabytes and still it's like, oh, okay. You know, and then it takes like a month for them to get back. So it doesn't beat the purpose. I actually disagree with you only on one point is that you, you said you don't want to monetize it. I definitely think you should. Because I think there should be a lot more people who are actually trying to do this, who try to connect people so it's like easier, for example, for companies like, like us that actually want to optimize assets. But let's take, for example, Indonesia. We have absolutely no choice in Indonesia. We're, we're talking now, for example, the likes of CD networks that have one POP in Jakarta. And we're thinking of opening two more. And they're all really interesting for us because at least they can serve the traffic for 10 companies. Right, so now we're like picking, oh, okay, who are gonna be the 10 companies that we offer this to? It's like being in like UN in a, in a war situation, right? And you're throwing out bread. And it's like people are jumping up for the bread, right? So it's really bad. So I think what you're doing is really good. And I hope there are a lot more like that. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Right, let's give him some by, by the way, is there anyone from Akamai? We, we shouldn't be like talking bad about anyone. This is all like I love that we're sharing these stories. Like this is really what the meetup is for. Like to, to meet people who are working on other web performance problems, and we can sort of get feedback. And, and like there might be someone from Akamai here who's probably now now not going to raise their hand. It's okay. This is a safe environment. You're welcome to come out. If, if you are, we should totally host it at your because you are the inspiration for all other CDNs in the world. You guys started at the first one. And I mean, that's incredible with the amount of good that it has done for the world. I, I think that's really commendable. Uh, no, uh, sounds like we should all applause now, but there's nobody here probably. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish here then. Okay, thank you very much, Sebastian.